Good morning and welcome to Dedication Sunday here at Grace Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you have joined us either in person or online, and we trust that you'll be blessed by your presence with us today. Since this is Dedication Sunday, we will be inviting our members and close friends to come forward near the end of worship to dedicate their financial commitments for the coming year. You'll simply come forward and place it in this basket. We'll have a prayer over that before you leave. If you are visiting with us today, do not worry. We do not expect this of you. And if you plan to pledge but forgot your card at home, don't worry. We have extras in the pews in front of you. You've got at least 45 minutes to make up your mind what to write on it. So you'll be okay. And finally, if you are simply not in a position to pledge this year, if you, know, you really can't figure out how to buy groceries, how to pay rent, and so on, don't worry. We would not ask this of you. The only thing we do ask of you in that situation is that you let us pray for you so that you might experience God's blessing and God's care within the year to come. So with those thoughts in mind, I invite you to join me in the worship of a God who does strive to meet our every need and bless us along the way. Praise the Lord. Praise, Praise God, God in his sanctuary. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and the lyre. Praise him with tambourine and dancing. Praise him with the strings and the flute. Let everything that has breath play, praise the Lord. Praise, Praise the Lord.
want to talk to both of you today about eyes. You both have really pretty eyes. And you know, eyes communicate so many things. Like if you look at that picture right there, that's a really pretty set of eyes. What do you think that's communicating? Anything? I think they're smiling too. I think she's smiling. What about this one? Hmm. <laughs> Looks like a horror movie. Well, I don't know about that, but I'd say she doesn't look very happy, right? That she's mad at someone. You're right. I'd, I'd say she's pretty mad. What about this one? say that looks pretty sad too. She looks like she's maybe about to cry or he does. What about the next one? It's like a baby. You're right. It does look like a baby, but what are the baby's eyes saying? Smiling too. I think you're right. I think that baby's probably smiling. That's happy. And here's one more. Lots of awes on that one. Just like Confused, maybe? I don't know if baby confused, but I, there's, I'd call that a look of wonder. That baby's just sort of taking in everything, seeing what's all around him or her, probably her with a pink hat on and those beautiful blue eyes. That's really something. But the reason I mention all this is that not only do eyes communicate a lot, they tell us a lot about what's going on, there's even something cooler about eyes, and that is you actually have a choice about the things on which you focus, the things you choose to see. Even on a beautiful day when the sun is shining, you know, you can choose to focus on something that's kind of irritating and annoying, something that really ticks you off. And if you do that, you're going to have a really bad, beautiful day. And then, but it's also possible on really cloudy, yucky, awful days when everything's going wrong to find something, something that is encouraging, something that's beautiful. And if you focus your eyes on that, you can actually have a really good day, even when other things are going wrong. And the reason I bring this up today is that the people of Israel in the book of Exodus, we've been talking about that the last several weeks, they had had a lot of bad days. They had some really bad days in Egypt as slaves. Then they had some really hard days in the wilderness because they didn't know how to live there. Then they got in big trouble with God by breaking some of his rules. That was a really bad day too. But the cool thing is that God still loved them, God still cared about them, and God still gave them something on which they could focus their energy and their time. God helped them to actually build a sanctuary, what's called a tabernacle in those days. And whenever they looked at that tabernacle, they were reminded that God was still with them, God still cared about them, God still loved them. Now, our sanctuary is a little different than theirs, but the real message is still the same. People come here to hear a word from God and to be reminded that when they focus on God and what God has done in the world, life looks a whole lot better in all kinds of ways. So with that, why don't we pray? Dear God, thank you for the opportunity we have to choose the things on which we focus. And this month in which we're encouraged to develop a spirit of thanksgiving, help us in your mercy to focus well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God doesn't call us to a blind faith, but to a faith that is eye-opening and mind-expanding. But we often find it more beneficial for ourselves if we pretend we cannot see or understand God's vision for creation. So please stand and join me in the prayer of confession. Dear God, Dear God when, when we pause to see the beauty in all you have created, and when, when we recall that you created us in your own image, our hearts are filled with reverence and praise. Forgive us for the times we have ignored these precious gifts, and forgive us for the times we have abused them. Then show us how to join your work of recreation so that our lives might be a source of inspiration to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The good news in Christ is that when we face ourselves and God with the awareness of our need, we are given grace to grow and courage to continue the journey. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We are so glad to be in worship together this morning.
Having now sung about God's amazing grace, we can share some reasons we have to give thanks not just for that grace, but for other blessings within our lives. And on this particular Sunday morning, I think it's important for us to thank God for the work of our veterans, those who have labored so hard and fought so long to keep us free. It is our custom on this Sunday to recognize veterans who've served in various branches of the armed forces. So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand by service and just remain standing until the end. It won't take long. Let's begin with the U.S. Army. Any Army veterans here? Okay, fantastic. How about the U.S. Navy? Navy vets. Very good. We have any Marines in the group today? U.S. Marines? What about the Air Force? Air Force veterans? Thank you very much. It's also important for us, of course, to remember those who guard us close to home. Coast Guard, National Guard. Do we have any veterans from those services? Finally, I think it's also important to us to remember armed law enforcement personnel who keep us safe. Anyone who has worked in that field, you are also invited to stand at this time. We thank you for your service. Please join me in a round of applause. You may be seated. Um, Even as we do uh, give thanks for these veterans, there are many other reasons to give thanks in this morning's bulletin, but you might be thankful that there isn't enough time to mention them all. Um, So I'm going to invite you to take that bulletin home, study it carefully throughout the week, and learn some of the things that may be gleaned from it. In a similar fashion, we don't have time to go through all the prayer requests that are listed there, but I do want to mention one that came in yesterday. Bob Swanee was hospitalized yesterday with some serious abdominal pain, and so I know he would appreciate your prayers. So would Laura Lee Biama. There's an update on her, Nancy Boitano, Sally Grothy, and every other person listed in that bulletin. So once again, take it home and use it in your prayer time throughout the week. And let us begin that process now. Dear God, we are so grateful for the gospel of freedom and for those who lived and died to free us from oppression. We're also grateful for him who lived and died to free us from our sin. Inspired by his mercy and his healing grace, we intercede today for those we know and love, both at home and abroad. We remember those who are suffering from physical discomforts, Ease their sense of pain. Remember those who are struggling with emotional distress. Wind down the many burdens that they bear. We remember those who are wandering into difficult or dangerous places. Save them, call them, draw them to yourself. And finally, God, we intercede for us that we might be your messengers of mercy, hope, and strength for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. For it is he who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This morning's Bible text is an answer to prayer, Moses' prayer, that God would go with his people in the wilderness. Up until this point, God has appeared on mountains, God's appeared in hailstorms, God's appeared in fire. But those images of God were not very accessible to most people in that day. So, in answer to Moses' prayer for companionship, 
God instructs Moses to build a tent, an extremely elaborate tent known as a tabernacle in which God's presence could be seen and felt. This tent brought God much closer to the people he sought to lead. It also revealed some distinctive aspects of God's character that had not yet been seen in Exodus. There's a lot of detail here. You can't possibly grasp it all in first reading. But there's a lot of beauty, too. So I invite you to listen carefully for this aesthetic side of God. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel that they may take an offering for me from each person whose heart prompts him to give. These are the offerings you shall receive, gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarns, acacia wood, ram skins, goat hair, and fine twined linen, oil for the lamps, spices for the incense, onyx for the apod, and jewels for the breastplate. With these items, they will create a tabernacle where I shall dwell among them. That's a pretty expansive list. Some things were pretty common in the world where they lived, ram skins, goat hair, but others were quite precious and quite rare. Even the yarns described in this text were really hard to make. Scarlet, for example, came from a very special worm that was crushed to make red dye. And while the colors blue and purple came from shellfish, crushed shellfish, but it took thousands of those shells just to make a single pint of dye. So this was not going to be just some shabby tent in the wilderness. The goat hair would protect it from the elements, but once you got inside, it was spectacular. Make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twined linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim, skillfully worked into them. Each curtain shall be six feet wide and 45 feet long. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another to create much wider panels, and you shall couple them with 50 clasps of gold. Join two of them, join two of these sets so that the tabernacle may become a single whole. For those of you who are mathematically inclined, this creates a really big tent. 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet high. Pretty impressive back in those days. We don't know exactly how the cherubim were inscribed. They might have been embroidered, or there might have been a gold leaf applique. But we do know they weren't babies, flying little babies. That was in medieval art and Renaissance. Back in the biblical days, Chances are that these cherubim would have been rather fearsome overall, either flying animals or men. Outside the tabernacle, build a bronze laver with which the priests can wash and an altar of acacia wood that is five feet high, seven feet wide, and seven feet long. Place a horn on each corner of the altar and overlay the altar with bronze. Make a grating for it. Then make a bronze ring at each corner of the altar through which long poles can slide. This altar should be hollow so that it may be carried with those poles. For those of us who like to barbecue, <clears throat> this is an interesting tidbit. Until I read this text the last week, I didn't realize that the altar in Exodus was hollow, was not made of stone, was completely portable. So in that sense sort of like an enormous backyard grill. Inside the tabernacle, build two chambers, the holy room and the most holy room. Within the holy room, place three items, a lampstand, a table, and an incense altar. Each of them shall be overlaid with gold. The lampstand shall consist of one shaft and six branches, three on each side of the shaft. Its cup shall look like almond blossoms, and almond buds shall be engraved throughout. 
This particular item of furniture is still used in Jewish temples and synagogues. Almost every synagogue has one. Today it's called a menorah. I don't know exactly why it's supposed to look like an almond tree. Perhaps they found that especially appealing in those days. But I do know that the total of seven branches, three in each side plus one in the center, is supposed to represent the seven days of creation. Thus, we're thanking God not just for Exodus when we hold up a menorah. We're also thanking him for his work in the universe and his creative touch throughout it. The incense altar shall be three feet high, 18 inches long, and 18 inches wide. Make horns on each corner and overlay wood with gold. Surround it with gold molding and place gold rings beneath the molding so that it may be carried with poles. The incense shall consist of onica, galbanum, and frankincense ground into a powder. Do not use this mixture for any other purpose, for it is holy to the Lord. This passage tells us that the tabernacle was not just supposed to look good, it was also supposed to smell good. We don't know exactly what Anika was, but we know it came from some sort of sea creature, probably a sea snail, and it was pretty hard to find those creatures. Galbanum comes from a plant that grows in Kurdistan, high up in the mountains of Iran, so that would have been quite costly too, while frankincense comes from the Horn of Africa. The combination of these elements would be incredibly valuable and extremely rare in the time of Moses. So they would have had to spend some big money to bring all those spices in. The table shall be two feet high, three feet long, and 18 inches wide. Overlay the wood with gold, including a gold molding, and four rings beneath the molding, so that it may be carried with poles. Make golden pitchers, bowls, and plates for the table. Then place the bread of the presence on those plates. Two stacks of six loaves should lie at all times. This table would have been kind of short by the standards of our day, just about two feet high, but Remember, in those days, most people dined while sitting on the floor. I'm not sure exactly what they put in those pitchers. Most scholars think it was probably some sort of wine. But I do know about the bread. Those 12 loaves of bread are supposed to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, who originally dwelt in Palestine, then in Egypt, then coming back out again. Even though most common people could not enter the holy place, this bread was a symbol of their presence. This bread reminded the priests, at least, that this was not just the home of God. It was also a home for God's people. The bread of the presence symbolized that all of them were there. And that leads us to the last item in the sanctuary, the one and only item in the most holy place. The most holy room shall contain a chest four feet long, two feet wide, and two feet high. It too shall be overlaid with gold and secured with four gold rings, two on each side, so that it may be carried with poles. These poles are to remain within the rings of the ark. They shall not be removed. Place the two stone tablets that I gave you within the ark and cover it with two cherubim made of hammered gold. The cherubim should face one another with their wings spread upward, overshadowing the lid. There I will meet you and give you my commands for the Israelites. The last line's really fascinating if you think about it. I'd always heard that only the high priest could approach the golden ark and he could only do it once per year But in this morning's passage, Moses does have access. And when God's people finally enter the promised land, crossing the river Jordan, the book of Joshua says that this ark is proudly carried across the river before them for everyone to see. I don't know exactly how often this image would have been seen by the average Hebrew, but we know that it was holy, very holy, We also know that its construction was incredibly important. 
And that's why God names two specific people as master craftsmen to lead the whole nation of Israel in designing this majestic tent. Then the Lord said to Moses, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, from the tribe of Judah, and Oholiab, son of Ahisamach, from the tribe of Dan. I have filled them with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, and I have filled them with the Spirit of God. They are to make this tabernacle according to the plans that I have given you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, I told you there was a lot of detail, <laughs> and there certainly is. You can't possibly absorb all of this in just one reading. But if you look a bit beyond the detail at the bigger picture, I think there are some fascinating things to glean, at least three of which I'd like to mention here today. First, God is concerned with beauty. We tend to think about God creating cosmic beauty. Planets, stars, galaxies, and so on. We also tend to think of God creating global beauty. Mountains, oceans, rivers, and so on. This morning's text reveals that God also loves details. The colors in a butterfly. The shapes in a seashell. The fragrance of an almond blossom, too. But there is one difference between that type of creation and those mentioned in this morning's text. In this morning's text, God does not work alone. Instead, God invites us to participate in creating beauty. God doesn't do this alone. He works with us. The fabrics in the text are beautiful. The furnishings in the text are beautiful. The odors in the text are beautiful. And God directed these 12 nomadic tribes to make them. Now, some of you might be thinking, how in the world can 12 nomadic tribes come up with all the cash for this stuff? And there's at least a couple of answers to that. First, uh, the book of Exodus tells us that before they left Egypt, they were invited to receive gifts from their former masters, and they expropriated these gifts with them when they went into the wilderness. Second, Exodus tells us that there was actually a population boom. It begins in chapter 1 of that book. That's one reason Pharaoh's a little scared of the Hebrews. They're growing too fast, and it continues throughout the book of Exodus, so that by the time we get to Numbers, we're told there are 30 thousand people all together in this group. 30,000 people can do some pretty big things when they put their minds to it, and evidently they did, based upon this morning's text. Of course, we don't have that many people. We don't have that kind of money either. But here at Grace, we do have the ability to make beauty. And we also have some people who have worked hard to make that happen are Bezalels and Oholiabs. It starts outside the building with those who spent countless hours on our landscape, grasses, flowers, trees, and shrubs. It continues inside the building with those who design this big open space and those who work so hard to keep it both comfortable and clean. Some of them were here yesterday making sure that these lights work continues as you go forward in the sanctuary to this table. So beautifully crafted today. I'm pleased to report that will continue throughout the month of November. And then, of course, when November is done and we move into Advent, this whole sanctuary will be decorated. Every one of you will have a chance to join God's creative work as well. But I also need to mention some other forms of beauty. We don't do much with incense here, thank God. Always makes my eyes burn. But we do a lot with music. Last week, we sung with bagpipes. On Christmas, we'll sing with woodwinds or strings. Every week, we sing with a wonderful accompanist and a really fine choir, too. No less than Bezalel and Oholiab 
you are making beauty too. And we appreciate it. So God's concern with beauty, God invites us to participate in that process. But perhaps even more important, truly sacred objects reveal a message of great beauty too. This morning's text, it's all about God's presence. How does a holy God dwell with a sinful people without causing all kinds of havoc? Moses pleaded with God to make that happen, and the tabernacle was God's answer to that prayer. Our world is very different, our church is different too, but we also have sacred objects, sacred furnishings to recall Protestant reformers called them signs and seals of grace. This table, for example, is beautiful, not just because we made it lovely, but because it holds the symbols of Christ's presence, his body and his blood. This pulpit is beautiful, not just because of how it was designed, but because it is the place in which God's living word is proclaimed a word that can bring comfort, strength, and hope. That font is a beautiful object, not because we made it lovely, but because it holds the waters of baptism, waters through which all peoples may be forgiven and set free. And finally, that cross is a beautiful object, not just because of how we lit it, but because it reveals the essence of our faith. Even when we blow it, even when we sin, God provides a means of grace. God sent his son to live and die for us. So the tabernacle is one sign of God's presence, but we have our signs as well. And every one of them can help us to recall who our God is, a God of beauty, a God of mystery, a God of wonder, a God of strength, but most important of all, a God who chooses to dwell with us and free us from our sin. Scripture teaches us much more about that God, the God we know in Christ It tells us that on the night he was betrayed, our Lord took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In a similar way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And finally, the apostle reminds us, that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we do proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. This is a joyful feast of the people of God. Therefore, I encourage you to lift up your hearts. We lift up the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to the grace. Gracious God, we do thank you. Let the heavens be joyful, the earth be glad. We thank you for creating the whole world, for the tabernacle in which you dwelt in the wilderness, and for Jesus Christ in whom you dwell with us. Born of Mary, he shares our life. Eating with sinners, he welcomes us. Visiting the sick, he heals us. Dying on the cross, he saves us. Rising from the dead, he gives new life. Thus it is with thanksgiving we take this bread and cup Proclaim the death and resurrection of the Lord. Receive our sacrifice of praise. And pour out your spirit upon us, that this meal may become for us a true communion in the body and blood of Christ. Make us one with Christ and all who share this feast. Unite us in faith. Inspire us to hope. Compel us to love. Until we join the saints in every time and place, saying, Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen.
Having just mentioned the great company of saints found in Scripture, it is also important for us to recall that we do share the faith of those saints, a faith that has been traditionally expressed in the Apostles' Creed. Thus, it is our custom on Communion Sundays to share that creed together. I invite you to join me in it now. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion, communion of saints, saints, forgiveness of sins, sins, the resurrection of the body, body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. In just a moment, we will invite you to receive both the bread and the juice. If you are new to us today, you might need to know that there are actually two lids. A clear one releases the wafer, the full one releases the juice, and you are invited to assume both of those as our choir sings.
Having now celebrated the beauty of the one body in which we are all joined together through the blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we will now invite you to come forward and respond to his sacrifice with some token of your devotion to him. As I mentioned at the start of the service, we don't expect this of visitors. We certainly don't expect this of those who are undergoing severe financial stress. We don't want to burden anyone, but we do want to bless everyone with the joy of commitment. When you make commitments to God, God makes commitments to you, and so many new fresh blessings can be seen. Thus, as Donna continues to play quietly, and as you've had some time to think and pray, I'll invite you to come forward with your commitment card and place it in this bowl. Then when everyone has had time to do that, we'll conclude this service with prayer. Gracious God, we do give you thanks for this sacrament which you give yourself to us. May we who have received these elements be strengthened in your service. We who have sung your praises declare your glory and truth. We who have sensed the depth of your commitment to our salvation respond to that commitment with small steps of our own until the love of Jesus Christ and be revealed anew and afresh. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. the good news of the gospel. Wherever you go, God goes with you. Wherever you are, God is already there. 
The same God who dwells in you has something he wants to do through you where you are. So go forth with God's blessing to bless the lives of others, remembering that Christ walks with you. Oh